If you have a Bible, you want to turn to Psalm 34. <clears throat> Psalm is in the uh, Old Testament. It's kind of in the middle of your Bible. Good chance if you just kind of go to the middle and open it up, you might hit Psalm. You may get hit Job or Ecclesiastes or Proverbs, and it's right in there. It's Job, Psalms, Proverbs. Um, there are going to be Psalms. Psalm 34. The book is called Psalms, but when you refer to a single chapter, it's Psalm. So <laughs> make sure I say that right. Uh, but it's good to be here with you guys this morning. I'm so glad that you're a part of what's happening here um, at FBC Allen. It is a big week for us as we get, get ready for vacation Bible school. Um, and again, as I said earlier, I, I hope that you will be praying about it. And um, if you would still, as an adult or student, if, if you would still like to volunteer, we've got spots for you uh, that we can place you. And uh, talk, talk to Lisa about that. So we, we actually started a brand new sermon series for the summer, and it's called Summer in the, uh, summer in the Psalms. And we're preaching through different chapters this summer uh, uh, in the book of Psalms. And we're looking at what, obviously, we can learn from these Psalms and how we can apply uh, the teachings to our lives. And, and Chad, our pastor, he kicked off the series last week. Uh, and if you missed it, I encourage you to go back uh, to our website, and you can actually watch all of our sermons. You can catch up on, on ones from, from way, gone, you know, way, way back in the past or, um, or, or, you know, or the most recent ones. But I encourage you to go back and, and, and look at that one because he shared uh, a, a testimony, some things that's been going on, things that have been going on in his life. And he, and he spoke out of, of Psalm 88. And I don't know if you've ever read Psalm 88, but it's not a very, it's not a very happy chapter uh, in the Bible. In fact, the last verse of that chapter, if you remember, it says, You have distanced loved one and neighbor from me. Darkness is my only friend. And that's, that's not a happy way to end a psalm. And that's not the writer, the author of that psalm talking to another guy. That's, that's him talking to God. That's, that's what he's telling God. And, and, um, and, and that's, to me, that's the beauty of the psalms because the beauty of the psalms is they're about real life. They're about real struggles. They're about real questions that people have, real doubts and real fears. And the book of Psalms is also about real joy real victories, real celebrations in sensing God's very real presence in our lives. And as, as dark as Psalm 88 is, the psalm that we're, we've already read today, and we're going to read again, Psalm 34, it's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, the, the author of Psalm 88, he was, he was in the middle of a dark valley in his life. And King David, who actually wrote Psalm 34, um, he was looking back on one of the many instances in his life where God was faithful to him. So Psalm 88 looks at life's struggles and how we can continue to be faithful to God in those struggles and how he continues to be faithful to us. And Psalm 34 looks at life's victories and how we know those victories come from God. And I want to read this chapter again, and, but before we do, your Bible, how many of your Bibles, if you have one open or may have a notation on your cell phone or whatever, there's a notation at the beginning of it that just kind of gives a little description about it, Yeah. Okay, mine does too. Um, and and it's, it's quite a description. And to get the context, we have to look back uh, at something that happened in David's life. And it's in, uh, you don't have to turn there, I'm going to read it to you. But it's 1 Samuel 21, 10 through 15. And this is, this is what my Bible says, the description. It says, concerning David, when he pretended to be insane in the presence of Abimelech, who drove him out and he departed. So pretending to be what? Insane. Okay, so we have to, okay, well, what's going on here? So I'm going to read. I'm going to read what that's referring to. It says, So David escaped from Saul and went, went to King Achish of Gath. But the officers of Achish were unhappy about his being there. They said, Isn't this David the king of the land? They asked. Isn't he the one the people honor with dances, singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands? David heard these comments and was very afraid of what King Achish of Gath might do to him. So he pretended to be insane, scratching on do listen to this, scratching on doors and drooling down his beard. It's uh, one of uh, David's uh, top moments in his life, it sounds like. Finally, King, and what King Achish says here is awesome. Finally, King Achish said to his men, must you bring me a madman? We, were all, we already have enough of them around here. Why should I let someone else like this be my guest? And so here's what's going on. David wasn't safe in Israel. If you know anything about uh, uh, your Bible history or if you're just brand new, let me catch you up. Saul is the king 
of Israel, and he was appointed by God, and, and Saul didn't quite do exactly what God wanted him to do, and so uh, David was going to replace Saul. Not Jonathan, who was, David's son, who was Saul's son. God chose and appointed David. And so Saul didn't like this. One, he, he didn't like it that he was going to be replaced, and two, he didn't like it that his son wasn't going to be the, the heir to the throne. And so Saul began to get really jealous. Matter of fact, Saul heard that song, you, you, the song that was referred to, Saul killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And so people began to really notice David, and Saul didn't like this. And so Saul spent a lot of his reign, towards the end of his reign, trying to kill David. And so David wasn't really safe there in Israel. And so for some reason, he thought it would be safer to go live with the enemies, the Philistines. Okay, that's, that's common sense, right? If I'm, if I'm not safe in my hometown, let me go to my enemies. Okay, but the Bible, and, and, and why he chose to do that, no one really knows. The, the Bible doesn't say why David thought he would be safer with the Philistines. Perhaps he thought they wouldn't recognize him as the one who killed Goliath. Now remember, Goliath was a Philistine, okay, and he was their mighty warrior. And who killed him? David. Now he did it when he was younger, so maybe he thought they wouldn't remember him. And here's the crazy thing. If you read a little bit before in, in, in 1 Samuel in that chapter, when David, goes in, when David goes over there with the Philistines, he's actually bringing the sword of Goliath with him that he used to chop off Goliath's head. So, you know, no, surely no one will ever <laughs> notice that or pay attention to that. Um, so the, um, would, they, would they notice him? What would they do? Perhaps they wouldn't recognize him. Uh, and they would just kind of welcome him in as a, as a traveling, you know, as a stranger and take him in. The Bible doesn't say that when, but it does say that when he arrived in the, in the Philistine town, the people recognized him right away. They knew it was him. After all, in addition to killing Goliath, David, he had that reputation for being an exceptional military power, okay? Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his ten thousands, and so David became extremely afraid when he knew that the Philistines, the enemy of the Israelites, when they recognized him. So would they, would they imprison him? Would they kill him? So David, what did he do? What any normal person would do, he pretended to be insane. He, he, uh, uh, he pounded his head on the city gate. He was foaming at the mouth. His spit was dripping from his beard. And the Philistines wanted, they wanted actually nothing to do with him once he started acting like this. And again, King Achish says, can't you see that this guy is crazy? Why did you even let him in here? Do you think, don't you think, now remember, don't you think we have enough crazy people around here? Look at you guys. You guys are crazy enough. And why would you want to bring anyone else in here with me? And so David manages to escape. And so as David is, is writing this psalm, he's recalling God's protection in that moment. He's recalling God's deliverance, and he's recalling God's presence in his life at that moment. So let's, let's read it again together. Or no, actually, I'll read it. You follow along. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and rescued me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and that Lord heard him, the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord, for those who fear him lack nothing. Young lions lack food and go hungry, but those who seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is someone who desires life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to remove all memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and rescues, from, and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. Verse 19, one who is righteous has many adversities, but the Lord rescues him from them all. He protects all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil brings death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. <clears throat> So a couple of weeks ago, um, I said in the children's sermon, we'd already kind of done our, our big family vacation uh, for the summer. Uh, we did it right when the kids got out of school. 
And a couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity, part of that, we were in uh, Washington, D.C. Any, any of you been to Washington, D.C.? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty amazing place. We were only there, part of our trip, we were only there for like two days. So we had, we, had to, we had to hit the highlights. And, you know, you could spend a week or two in D.C. just looking at everything, and you, would still, you still wouldn't catch it all. And so we, we really hit the ground running. Fortunately for us, we were also there at the same time that every middle school in America decided to send their eighth graders to Washington, D.C. So that, didn't make, that, that just made the trip all that much more better and sweet to us, to have sweet fellowship with eighth graders. Uh, I, I, I love the eighth graders, but, you know, they don't anyway. But uh, so <laughs> I encourage you to try that sometime. Um, but one of the obvious things that makes D.C. Uh, amazing is all of the memorials, the statues, the buildings that are there uh, to honor important people honor the important events in our history that shaped us who we are as a country today. Uh, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, the Washington Monument, the Vietnam Memorial, the World War II Memorial, uh, the MLK Memorial, uh, Arlington Cemetery, and there's, there's, there's so, so many more. And they're actually, they're, they're visual reminders of our history. And they're visual reminders of, of all we must be thankful for as citizens of this great nation. And they're visual reminders of what we stand for as a country and how those events should shape our present and our future. A big part of D.C. is, is looking back so that we can continue to move forward. And that's what David is he's doing here. Uh, David is looking back at God's provision in his life. He's looking back and, and he's rem reminding himself, he's reminding his readers, he's reminding us of God's faithfulness, God's protection, his provision, his love, his presence, his strength, and his care. And David wasn't, he wasn't just recalling history, but he was also celebrating a current reality in his life in this time. And he knew that those things would still be true in the life that he had left, the, the life that was still before him. You see, God, God is faithful, period. Whether you're stuck in a life that, that sounds a little bit more like Psalm 88 <clears throat> or your life is looking more like Psalm 34, God never changes. He's always the same and he's Lord over all. And like David, many of us, we can look back at God's faithfulness in our lives where we've experienced his power, his deliverance, his presence, his leadership, and we've experienced his love. And it's good to look back and remember, but the point, listen to this, the point of remembering is so that we can continue to move forward. <clears throat> Being a follower of Christ is not just about what was. It's not just about becoming a follower, becoming a Christian, asking Christ to come in your life. That's, it's, it's not it. That's, that's important. That's where you start. But being a follower of Christ means letting God continue to shape you now and letting God continue to shape your future. We look back so that we can continue to move forward because what was true of God then is still true of God today. And so Psalm 34 is filled with things for us to do, uh, things that David did and things that he encouraged his readers to do. And, and before we go too far, I, I want you to know that David, he wrote some pretty dark Psalms too. It wasn't just Psalm 34 for David all the time. It wasn't always celebration. But David, despite his circumstances, he knew who God was. He knew what God could do. He knew what God had done. And he knew that God was always going to be faithful in the darkness of life and also in the sunny days of life. In Psalm 34, God uses David's words to challenge us and to call us to a life that honors him. It's, it's what I like to call the good life. Now, let me define good life for you because I, I know when I say when I ask you, what's it, tell me about what, what's the good life. A lot of you can think about a lot of different things, but I want to define that for you. See, the good life is not about money or about promotion or riches or material things or possessions. The good life, you ready for this? The good life is a life, it's about a life that is lived totally and completely for God with his help and with his strength. So when I say good life, I don't immediately want you to go to your favorite vacation spot or, or, you know, or, or, or start thinking about all the, the, the stuff that you would buy or what your good life would look like. When I say good life, I want you to think godly life. And here's what David says about the good life. The first thing is this, is that the good life is characterized by worship. Worship that comes from thankfulness and humility. 
The good life is characterized by worship that comes from thankfulness and humility. You can hear, you can hear the determination in, in David's voice, and I hope you, you left Psalm 34 open because we're going to look at that back and forth. He says, I will bless the Lord. He's going to worship the Lord. I will do it. I'm, it's not when I get to it or if I think about it or I have time. I will bless the Lord. I will worship the Lord. He's, David is no fool. Okay, he may act like an insane fool to get out of that, but in reality, he is no fool. He knows exactly where his blessings come from. David knows that any good in his life, it's come from God. And it was true in David's life, and it's true in our lives. I know a lot of times we want to take credit for things. Why? Because we work hard for things. We work hard. We, we put in a lot of effort. We, we want to say, look what I did. But to do that, I think, would be foolish. Why? Because God, God's the one that gave you life. God's the one that gives you strength. God's the one that gives you the ability to do what you do, the ability to, to work the way that you work, to earn what you earn, to do all that you've done in your life. And that should lead us to the two things. It should lead us to thankfulness and it lead us to humility. Thankfulness for a God who promises forgiveness and salvation to those who believe. Thankfulness for a God who promises his constant presence an unconditional love, thankfulness for a God who promises to give us exactly what we need to make it through each day. I want to ask you a question. When was the last time that you said, thank you, God, for, and then you were really super specific? Not, thank you, God, for this day. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Or, God, thank you for my life. But when was the last time that you just got super specific with God and said, God, thank you today that when I opened my refrigerator, there was food in there. Because I know that there's a reality in this world that people don't even know what they're going to eat for their next meal. God, thank you that when I walked in today, I, I walked, walked into my closet today, there were, there were clothes. Now I realize <laughs> I don't like any of them anymore, but thank you that I have options. Because I know that there are some people in this world who've been wearing the same shirt, pants, or shorts for the last six, seven, eight months. Father, thank you that today when I, I, I got up, I was able to get up and stand up. Because I know there's a reality for a lot of people in this world that they're not able to do that. You see what I'm saying? It's thankfulness. And David, David was going to worship. And one of the ways he was going to worship is when he was going to say thank you to God for all the different things in his life. And, I, I, and by the way, if you start to do that, I mean, that, that'll start to consume a lot of your day. You talk about praying without ceasing. Start saying, God, start thinking about things that you need to be thankful for God. And man, it'll change your perspective. So it's, it's worship and thankfulness, but also in humility. Humility, because we know without God, we're lost. Without God, we don't have life. Without God, we don't have eternal life. Without God, we don't have, we don't have hope. Humility, because God didn't have to love us. He didn't have to save us. He didn't have to die for us. He didn't have to forgive us. He didn't have to do any of it. The world hated him and he still loved the world that should humble us that should that should bring us to our knees god i i don't deserve this i don't deserve your love thank you for for loving me in spite of me thank you for loving me consistently and unconditionally even when i don't love you consistently and i put conditions on my love for you thank you for loving me god even though you know all of my secrets you know all of my thoughts. You know all of my sins. You know all of my fears. God, you know me, and you still love me. Thank you, God. I am, I am humbled by that. Isaiah 12, 4 says, And on that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make his works, make his works known among the peoples. Declare that his name is exalted. David said, proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. Why? Because of all that God has done and all that God continues to do. Tell the world about the God that we serve. Tell the world about the God that we love. Tell the world that God loves them. We want to worship him. The good life is a life characterized by worship. We worship him because we're thankful. We worship him because we are humble, because we know that everything comes from him. Second thing is the good life is characterized by wisdom, and not just any wisdom, but wisdom that comes from a desire for the Lord's will. 
The good life is characterized by wisdom that comes from a desire for the Lord's will. I was reading an article this past Wednesday <clears throat> that was called Left to Their Own Devices. And it was, a, it was a, on a counseling uh, blog. And it was an article about the dangers of children and teenagers uh, and their cell phones. And, and the interesting thing about the article was, because I almost didn't read it because I thought, okay, I've read like thousands of these articles. Okay, not that many. I've read several articles on this, seen a lot of stuff about kids and cell phones. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I get it. But the interesting thing about this article is that its focus wasn't on those usual things like, you know, accessing pornography or social media, cyberbullying, all those things. And those are important things. And those things are talked about a lot and they continue to be addressed. But this article was talking about the dangers that can happen when parents don't ever make their kids put the phone down and engage with the parents. The article says the greater concern we are not talking about as much is the progressive eradication of positive, mature adult influences. Young people are parenting and raising each other. How much time are we spending with our young people that is not interrupted by peer interaction? If it is an insignificant amount of time, then imagine the influence that their peer group has on them. We will have a generation of kids who are on their own, who are their own source of wisdom for one another. When mature, godly influences are removed or at least diminished, young people will be shaped by their friends, and by their culture. And I was reading that article, you know, and, and, and it's right. If we don't ever ask our kids or make our kids unplug and connect with adults, can connect with us as parents and other adults, that can become really dangerous because we have kids who are raising kids. But something similar is happening in the adult world too. And here's, the, here's how it's happening in the adult world, too. Yes, we are still connected to our phones, but we're also, we're looking for wisdom in all, in a whole bunch of other places instead of looking for the, for the true wisdom from the source of wisdom. Um, we, we're seeking truth from anything and everything and anyone other than the truth himself, Jesus Christ. And imagine that. Imagine a world where we seek wisdom from places that don't offer good wisdom. You don't have to imagine it. We live in it. We live in it. He's, Jesus isn't a source of truth. He is the truth. And every other outlet, listen to this, every other outlet that we seek to find truth or wisdom is going to point you right back to who? You. That's the wisdom that you're going to get. You do what you think is right. You do, you do what you believe is to be true. It's, it's not going to point you back to God. A good life, a godly life, is a life that finds wisdom in desiring the Lord's will for your life. That's what a good life is. David was clear where he went. He says, I sought who? I sought the Lord. Say that with me. I sought the Lord. Yes. The, the, the word sought in the Hebrew gives this idea of asking, but not just asking, but frequently asking, consulting with, studying with. Think, think about, have you ever, uh, have you ever been on, on walking on a grass where everyone else has walked before? I, I, I th you know, and there's just this trail now, and it's just a path that you see because everyone has been on that trail. And when you think about, I sought the Lord, that's the picture that I want you because it's something that you're doing constantly. You've just worn out a trail to God because that's where you're consistently and you're constantly going. You've worn out this trail in your heart and in your mind because that's where you're headed. It's like if you've ever been on one of those, I've talked about this before because it really cracks me up. You talk about, you ever been on a, on a trail ride uh, with, with horses? You know, and I always love it when, when they get the horses out, you know, they look at people, okay, here's your horse, here's your horse, and then they look at me and they bring out this giant Clydesdale and say, okay, here you go. This is the one you need to ride, buddy. And, and so they put you on there, and, and, and they make you think. You know, they give you this whole speech about, you know, you're a cowboy, and everything's going to be great, and here's how you make them stop, here's how you make them go, and here's how you turn them. But honestly, I've been on a couple of those, and here's what I do. I let go of the rein, okay, and the horse just goes. And guess what? When there's a turn, what does the horse do? I don't have to go, come here, Clyde. No, it, it just turns. Why? Because the horse has just done that every day for his miserable existence. That's kind of what he's done. He's ridden this trail. It gets you to the top, okay? And then he's got to have somebody like me on his back, and it's, it just makes everything even worse. But it's that kind of idea. It's like, I, I don't, I just, my mind, my heart, I just automatically go. I don't even have to, I just go to God because that's where I know I'm supposed to go. I'm not supposed to look anywhere else. I'm not supposed to get my wisdom from Facebook. I'm not supposed to get my wisdom from media. I'm not supposed to get my wisdom uh, from anywhere else. Where I'm supposed to get my wisdom is godly wisdom because that's going to give me, that's going to give me the good life. 
Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but here's the key. But understand what the Lord wants you to do. I sought the Lord. The good life does just that. It's trying to understand what the Lord wants you to do. And you find that wisdom by coming to his word. And I love what David said after that. He said, I sought the Lord and he answered me. When you seek the Lord and you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. When you knock on his door, he's going to open it. When you call out to him, he will answer you. The good life is also characterized by satisfaction that comes from a life surrendered to God. Now, there's a good word that you can equate to, to the good life, being satisfied, and the satisfaction that comes from a life that's surrendered to God. Now, I want you to know something about me. I'm going to say this out loud, and some of you know this, some of you don't, but I'll make a confession. I love Diet Coke, okay? I think it is uh, probably the greatest drink that was ever made. Is Louise Jacobs in here by chance? Is she here? Oh, she's my Diet Coke buddy. Oh, there you are. Hi, Louise. Are you going to get one in a minute? I'll meet you over there in Building E, and we'll share one together. Um, I, and I didn't mean to. Well, actually, I did mean to embarrass you, but anyway. Um, I love Louise. Diet Coke. Um, and, and we see each other, and I say, hey, do you have your Diet Coke? And she pulls it out of her purse. Ta-da! She's got it. She's always got it with her. But I, lo- I love this drink, and I actually have to thank my wife for this, because before I met her, I was always just Coke, regular Coke, and she introduced me. Uh, anything that had diet on it just made me want to puke. Um, but then I got into Diet Coke, and now because of her, I'm addicted, and I have a problem, so blame her. But anyway, um, yeah, but I love and, and I know it's bad for me, so don't, don't send me those emails, and don't at me on Twitter, and don't start linking me to articles on Facebook. I know it's bad for me. I get it. And so is everything else, okay? You, you eat everything else, or drink everything else, or you walk outside. You know, somebody's probably going to write an article that says, you know, listening to me is bad for you, so you probably should stop it. But the whole idea is I love it. But as much as I love Diet Coke, there are some times, several times I would say, where I'm, I am thirsty and the only thing I really want to drink is what? Water. Uh, matter of fact, several times on vacation, you know, we, we, we did a lot of walking. You know, I told you we didn't have much time, so we're just constantly on the go and it's hot. And you would get a Diet Coke and that would be okay, but sometimes what you needed is you just needed water. The only thing that was really going to quench my thirst was, was water. You get that thirsty? And, and, and the reason why is because water is what your body needs. Water is what your body, uh, it really craves. And nothing can really satisfy you uh, like water does. And um, our, our bodies crave it. But here's what our souls crave. Our souls crave God. Now we may not think that that's what it is, We may not call it that, but that's exactly what our souls crave. Our souls crave God. Uh, Nothing else will be able to satisfy like God, because we were created, and here's the thing, we were created by God for God. We weren't created by God for something else, or we weren't created by God for anyone else. We were created by God for, for God. And the only thing that will truly bring us true satisfaction, the only thing that will quench the thirst of our soul is is a life that is surrendered to God. And David says, he says, taste and see. Now, that seems kind of backwards, doesn't it? It, it, You feel like you should say, see and then taste. But what David is saying is that when you taste the word of God, when you get a taste of who God is, then you will begin to see like he sees. You will begin to see your life differently. You will begin to look at things differently. You'll begin to think about things differently. You'll begin to act things differently because when you take God's word in, then what it does is it transforms you. And notice that it's an, it's an action word. Our faith is not a passive faith. Some of you may not have heard that ever before or heard it in a long time. Our faith is not a passive faith. It's a faith of action. We're supposed to take refuge in him. And the only way that happens is if we purposely surrender to him. Our lives, whether we acknowledge or not, crave after God. He is our creator. That's what he created in us. He created in us a longing for him. We belong to him, so it makes sense that we would want to be with him. He is our creator, so it makes sense he would understand better than anything or anyone else what creation needs. We try other stuff. We do. 
I do. We try relationships. We try a religion. We try money. We try work. We try hobbies. We try all sorts of stuff to find peace. We try different relationships. We, we try to find satisfaction. But the truth is, all of that will fall short. As much as I love Diet Coke, you know, it falls short when what I really want and what I really need is water. They can't truly satisfy because they were never made to do that. Religion, relationship, money, uh, job, career, all those stuff. Those are things for us that we can enjoy in our lives. Those are things that God blesses us with. But we were never meant to center our lives around those things. Satisfaction only comes when we surrender to God. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When will you be? And make sure you catch that. When will you be satisfied? Only when you hunger and thirst for what? Righteousness. Not when you hunger and thirst for money. Not when you hunger and thirst for popularity. Not when you hunger and thirst for status. Not when you hunger and thirst for stuff. It's when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. For the things of God. Then that's when you will be satisfied. That's, that's the good life. What are you hungry for? What are you thirsty for? The good life happens when we crave the things of God. Everything else is just temporary. Moving on, the good life is characterized by integrity lived out through repentance and obedience. Integrity that's lived out through uh, repentance and obedience. And notice David in, uh, let's see here, in verse 11, he starts, he changes kind of what he's saying, not changes, but he, he addresses the people that he's writing to, and he says, children. He says, come children, listen to me. And I don't think that now he's looking at, little, he might be, uh, but I don't think he's necessarily looking at little kids now, but uh, that word in the Hebrew, it, it's, it's kind of the same word used for students. And so what David has done here now is he's kind of jumped into teacher mode. And what he's saying this is, and he wants, he wants them to learn submission, to God. Think surrender like we just talked about. Uh, and he wants to teach them submission to God and doing his will by living a life filled with integrity. And what is integrity? Integrity is choosing honesty over deception, choosing to do good over doing evil. Integrity is choosing to pursue peace over pursuing trouble. And that all starts with an acknowledgement that we've all chosen the other. We've chosen to be deceptive. We've chosen to be evil. We may not call it evil, but we've chosen to do that. We've chosen trouble, and we're all guilty. And a big part of integrity is owning, owning your mistakes and not running from them. You see, it's, it's easier, and we like to point out the mistakes of others. If you don't believe me, just, just pull up your social media account and watch all the pointing out of other people's faults that you see on there. Everyone is quick, quick to offer their opinion of why you're wrong why you need to be different, why you need to change your mind. And on social media, everyone is also very quick to point out that they're on the higher moral ground. Look at me. Uh, this is what I do. And to me, I think if you're living on the higher moral ground, you don't need to point that out. You just need to live it out, okay? But, but, but we're quick to point things out. But what we're not really good at is owning our stuff. David says he's going to teach us the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is recognizing God's perfection and in turn realizing how not like that that we really are, how not perfect we are. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. God knows, God knows you're not perfect. He knows that I'm not perfect. He sees everything. He knows everything about us, and he loves us anyway. So we need to own our stuff. We need to give it over to him and to live our lives in obedience to him. And how do you do that? Well, Proverbs 24, I mean, Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 tells us. It says, focus your eyes straight ahead. Keep your gaze on what is in front of you. Watch your feet on the way and all your paths will be secure. Don't deviate a bit to the right or to the left. Turn your feet away from evil. You notice David said we have to turn away from evil. Again, there's active. It's not passive. Because if we're passive, then guess what? We're just going to kind of go with the flow. 
wherever the current of culture goes, that's where we're going to go. We have to turn. And that's the idea here in the passage in Proverbs. It says, don't get distracted by other stuff in life. Don't get pulled away by the things that promise life, but always disappoint. Don't let your eyes wander to something that's going to pull you further and further away from God. Focus your eyes straight ahead. Don't deviate a bit. Stop walking that way and go the other way. But here's the deal. You have to execute. You have to decide. It's up to you whether you listen to and follow God or you ignore him and do your own thing. That's completely and totally up to you. And I, I, I think a lot about a, a, a coach uh, who calls in a play. Uh, he, tells, you know, he tells the kids what, what, what to do. He, uh, uh, but at some point, once, once he's done all the coaching and they go out on the field or on the court, the coach at that point is somewhat powerless because it's all up to the kids. Will they execute it like they drew it up? Will they listen? Will they recognize all the things that they were supposed to see and adjust to? Will they even do what he said, or will they, will they improvise? Will they change the play? Will they think that their coach is a goofball and do something else because they don't agree with him? And that's us. That's us. God tells us what we need to do. He tells us how to live um, so that our lives will go the way that they were meant to go, the way that he called us to live, the way that we were created. And after that, it's basically out of his hands. And I don't want to say that God is powerless, but God will not force his will upon us. So when he instructs us, when he teaches us, then it's given over to us and we have to decide. God's not going to force his hand. He's not going to force our hand. He doesn't force us to love him. That's not a relationship. Tell me any of you who are in a relationship where you're forced to love someone and you really enjoy that relationship. No, you don't. That's not relationship. God so desperately wants what's best for us, but how many times do we ignore him? How many times do we disagree because we think, God, that's crazy? How many times do we, do we call an audible? Or we look at circumstances and we go, whoa, this isn't going to work, God. I, I need to change up what you just said. Integrity means following God no matter what. There's a, there's a prayer I heard uh, long, a while back, and, and I pray it for a lot for myself. I pray it for my family, for my kids, and I pray it for our church. And it goes like this. It says, Lord, help me to know what the right thing is to do, and then give me the courage to do it. Help me to know what the right thing is to do, and give me the courage to do it. You see, it takes more than just knowledge, because we can, all of us, all of us can know the right thing to do. But it's about executing. That's integrity. Integrity is knowing what is right, and then doing it, and following through. You have to be obedient. The good life is a life that's lived in obedience to God. That's a life that's filled with integrity, a life that's marching towards God and not deviating from what he's called us to do. The last thing there is uh, the good life is a life that's characterized by comfort. Ooh, there's another good word that we like. Comfort that comes from the knowledge of God's presence and protection. It's comfort that comes from the knowledge of God's presence and protection. David doesn't talk about God's presence. I'm sorry, let me say this again. David talks about God's presence and protection multiple times in verses 15 through 22. Here's how he says it. He says, his eyes are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. The Lord hears. He rescues. The Lord is near. He saves. He says it again. He rescues. He protects. He redeems. He is a refuge. I counted 10 times in those eight verses. David says, God is present and God is protects. Now, do you think God, that, that David is trying to tell us something? Do you think God wants us to hear something there? We can take comfort in his presence and his protection. Psalm 23, verse 4, a psalm also written by David. It says this, even though I walk through, and I love how the Amplified uh, version reads, even though I walk through the sunless valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod to protect and your staff to guide, they comfort and they console me. David says, I I'm going to be okay because even though I walk through the valley, the dark valleys, the Psalm 88 valleys, I know that God is going to guide me. He's going to protect me and I can take comfort in that. That's 
the good life. The good life means that you walk in confidence because if we choose to follow God, we will not be overcome by our troubles. We won't. The only way that we let them overcome, the only way that they overcome us is if we let them overcome us and we choose to follow our own way and not follow God. It's not that we won't have troubles. We said that in our last sermon series. It's the fact that we don't have to allow them to overwhelm us because we follow the overcomer. Our God is bigger than any mountain we'll face. He's our shepherd. He's our protector. He's our guide in life's dark times and in life's good times. He never fails. So my question to you is, are you living the good life?